quarter past. All right, so why don't we get started? I'll welcome everyone to the yeah, 21. Um, thank you for uh, joining us on the, with this track. I also, before I start, I just also want to thank all the volunteers that, that uh, have made it possible, including my students, Krupa and Jordan, who are here uh, helping uh, to moderate the session. Um, and uh, thank all you, all the speakers and all the attendees. Um, TCF has been going on for 45 years and it's really a great tradition um, and um, we will keep it going and uh, hopefully next year we'll all be in person. Um, uh, with some discussion that we'll do some amount of um, uh, virtual access to the uh, to the proceedings uh, but I I think our, our plan is, or our hope at least at this point, and of course everything is uh, a little hard to predict right now, but our, our hope is that we'll all be together in viewing next year. Um, so, and before I introduce our first speaker, let me just mention a couple of things. Um, we, of course, we'd like to ask everyone to stay muted. Um, um, questions during the talks or maybe reserve to the end. So if the speakers are asking you to reserve questions until the end, then just please stay muted the entire time. The moderators will potentially just go in and mute people if they've accidentally left themselves unmuted. Um, and um, after the talks, we'll uh, open the floor for questions. And uh, I don't expect that we'll have any major technical problems. Obviously, we uh, see that we may have some minor technical issues, but if uh, for some reason the whole session crashes, just please immediately try to log back in. We'll all be rejoining each other. Um, if you have any questions that we can resolve, you can direct them in private chat if you'd like to myself or Krupa Tishby or Jordan Sinaway, who you can see uh, in the participants list. And one final note is that the session is being recorded and will be shared in the future. So with all that being said, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today. Um, we're going to be hearing from Jonathan Allen. Jonathan Allen received his PhD in applied physics from Washington University at St. Louis. And most of his career has been in photovoltaic research and development, but he also designs and builds custom RF radio frequency power systems and instrumentation. He's currently an independent consultant. And for the past six years, he's worked as a volunteer restoring and documenting the Sarnoff collection at TCNJ. So at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Jonathan Allen to tell us about New Jersey, New York City, and the birth of electronics. Thank you, Larry. I, I appreciate that. Um, let me start, though, by first by thanking Alex McGowan of the IEEE History Center and Ben Gross at the Linda Hall Library of Kansas City uh, for their assistance in searching for historical documents and, uh, and supporting material. To begin, since the 1980s, Silicon Valley has been the center for American electronic innovation. Before that, however, starting around 1900, the hub was, was right here in New Jersey and New York City. <clears throat> Most of the electronics that dominates our lives today saw its origins here. It began with, ba with, the, with the basics especially the, uh, those related to wireless communication and vacuum tubes, but it evolved into many additional technologies, and we will discuss as many as possible in the time we have. First of all, I want to define electronics as distinct from electricity in that electronics involves the movement of free electrons, either in space, in, through a vacuum, say, or as a plasma, through a gas, or uh, through a semiconductor, whereas electricity, dealing mainly with just metallic conductors. Now, uh, let's see what let's see what topics we're going to be doing. Uh, the inventions and developments uh, that we're going to look at are wi uh, wireless telegraphy, vacuum tubes, voice radio, broadcasting networks, electronic sound recording and reproduction, electrical and electronic instrumentation, FM radio, TV, transistors. And finally, of course, electronic computers. We couldn't skip that at an event like this. And so we are, uh, uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of stuff to cover. I'd appreciate if you hold your questions until the end, unless, I, unless you spot a serious error, in which case you should nail it right on the spot. So, let, so let's go. 
Long range wireless. In the 1860s, James Clerk Maxwell of Scotland worked out the famous equations that bear his name and which predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. Then between 1887 and 89, Heinrich Hertz in Hamburg demonstrated experimentally the existence of those waves transmitting from, from uh, along the length of his lab bench. But at that time, he could suggest no practical use for these waves. Additional experiments somewhat increased the distance, but it was uh, Guglielmo Marconi, <clears throat> whom we credit with the first practical use of electromagnetic waves to communicate over significant distances. In 1899, he founded the American Marconi Company, incorporated here in New Jersey. And that year, his station at Sandy Hook <clears throat> transmitted reports on the Americans' Cup race to the New, to the New York Herald. See, we've already linked New, New Jersey and New York City. For the 1901 race, the Publishers Association um, brought radio experimenter Lee Forrest, and we're going to hear a lot more about later, from Chicago to New Jersey. Unfortunately, bad atmospheric conditions interfered with successful reporting, but New Jersey gained that inventor. Dramatically increasing range on December 12, 1901, Marconi sent the first transatlantic radio signal from England to Newfoundland with a multi kilowatt spark transmitter and coherer with a, at a frequency which we believe was around 300 kilohertz. All it, all it was sent was a letter S, beep, 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 et cetera. Uh, and here we have the schematic of the transatlantic transmitter. It involved, it, as I say, it put out multi kilowatts. It involved two stages. The first stage um, generated the arc and then, uh, and then step-up transformers uh, increased the arc voltage so that it could then be fed to the antenna. And it was John Ambrose Fleming who helped him design this. Uh, Fleming will appear later also with, uh, with, as an important contributor. Now, it's, it's, it was, it, this was not yet reliable communication, but as things improved, Marconi was no longer restricted to the shortest possible path across the ocean. American Marconi was already established in New Jersey, so he set up a transmitting station at New Brunswick and a receiver in Belmar at uh, what's at Camp Evans. The, se the separation between the transmitter and receiver enabled the transmitter and receiver to operate simultaneously without risk of overloading the receiver. As equipment improved, the company began leasing radio and telegraph stations to, uh, to ships with the Marconi com uh, company operators on board to work them. By 1904, 32 ships were so fitted. In 1911, Marconi contracted with the Wanamaker department stores to set up stations on the top floors of their uh, stores in Philadelphia and New York. Uh, this was largely for, for publicity, but these were actually functioning communication stations. And here, um, whoop, I missed that one. Oh. Okay, anyway, uh, that slide is missing. Um, it was at the New York City station that young David Sarnoff uh, was on duty the, uh, the day in uh, 1912 that uh, the morning after the Titanic accident, he handled message traffic reporting the names of rescued passengers. This adventure pr uh, promoted the, the fame of wireless and especially the fame of Sarnoff and he loved fame. This is, uh, by the way, this is Marconi's transmitting antenna at Cornwell in, uh, in England that sent the message across the Atlantic. Uh, by the way, if you think those towers are gonna interfere with, uh, with the RF field, they ain't gonna because they were made of wood. They're not metal towers. In 1919, after World War I, the, uh, the US government decided that, that transatlantic radio communication was too important to the public good, today we call it national security, to be in the hands of foreign owned British Marconi Company. Therefore, the government helped General Electric buy out American Marconi and established the Radio Corporation of America to take over their wireless functions. 
The agreement also included uh, technology and invention sharing with the Westinghouse Company uh, and a couple of other firms and General Electric, obviously. The next step, of course, was AM voice radio. The spark transmitter generates a damp wave, a pulse each time the induction coil fires. So the receiver output would be a harsh buzz. This is okay for Morse code, but totally unsuitable for voice, which requires a continuous clean sine wave. The spark transmitter also splatters out a broadband signal, which pollutes the ether, uh, interfering with adjacent channels. The first step, attempt to get away from that was the Alexanderson alternator, which came into use in 1910. It uses extremely high RPM and a huge number of armature poles to generate AC, sinusoidal no less, at uh, up to uh, 200 kilohertz, but it can put out tens of kilowatts. <clears throat> it's possible to modulate it using magnetic amplifiers in the field circuit, although that really doesn't work very well. Truly successful voice radio can became possible only after the invention of vacuum tubes, which could amplify. And with positive feedback, they could oscillate to generate sinusoidal RF. More on this later. So how did this fundamental invention begin? Literally, as well as symbolically, it started with the glowing light bulb. Thomas Edison was the first to document the thermionic emission, that is the emission of electrons, the boiling off of electrons, if you will, from a hot metallic surface. And we still call this the Edison effect. In 1875, he observed dark deposits of evaporated carbon uh, from the uh, filament of, uh, of, uh, on the interior of his lamps. He was used, still using carbon filaments then. But there was a curious shadow in the deposit that lined up with the positive end of the DC filament. Somehow, the effect was influenced by electric fields. So Edison installed a metal plate facing the filament and located inside the evacuated bulb. If the plate was positive uh, with respect to the filament, a current flowed between them, but not if it was negative. He patented the effect. He tried to patent just about anything and published the findings in 1883. Of course, there was no physical theory at the time nor could Edison, Edison suggest any really practical use. But then in 1897, English physicist J.J. Thompson discovered the electron and identified it, measuring its charge to mass ratio and identifying it as the carrier of electric current. So the next big event was in January 1904 when John Ambrose Fleming, remember he, he had helped uh, um, uh, Marconi designed uh, his transmitter. Anyway, Fleming uh, in England, building on Edison and Thompson's discoveries, exploited the one-way conduction in order to rectify and thereby detect radio waves. By the way, I will, I'm willing to say that the, that the the Edison effect was the most important creation that Edison came out with. Anyway. Oh, I see. Here, I'm sorry. Here's the wireless state. The slide's got a lot of order. The wireless station on top of the Wanamaker store in New York City. And here is uh, David Sarnoff operating the station. Anyway, here's a Fleming valve detector. The signal comes in down the antenna through these coupled coils into the tuned circuit, parallel resonant LC circuit, and then through the um, uh, the rectifying diode located exactly as you would the uh, the crystal in, a, in the crystal set, which used, which used the Galena crystal. And here are your headphones to listen. Now, since the diode allowed just allowed one way flow, it suggested the check valve for fluids. Hence, Fleming named it the oscillation valve. And to this day, Brits could still call vacuum tubes valves. The next big step would have to be amplification to receive weak signals from afar. There were numerous dubious inventions, but none of them worked well. In the US, Leedy Forrest, now in New Jersey, experimenting with his version of the valve, noted 
that electric fields outside the bulb could alter the diode current. What if the field was put inside in the path of the current? Now a solid sheet of metal would block the, the flow of electrons, but what about a grid, a mesh-like thing? Hey, it worked. So in 1906, he patented what he called the audion, generically, uh, generically a triode, because it has three elements, cathode or filament, grid, and anode or plate. And these terms will be used somewhat interchangeably. Here we have a drawing of the audion with, as, you, as you'd expect, the, uh, the, cath the cathode, the grid, and the plate. Just a minute, let me fix something here. My little arrow was disappearing. I had to fix that. Here's a drawing of the uh, general uh, layout of the Audion. And here is a, a photo of a, uh, either the original or reproduction of the Audion. Um, the, and you can see that you've got the filament closest to you. Behind that, the zigzaggy wire is the grid. And behind that is the plate. As a detector, the Audion provided a gain above that of a simple diode. But, could it not, but it could not amplify successfully in the modern sense. Anyway, here's an Audion radio detector. And once again, the signal comes into the tuned circuit, the LC circuit, and then goes to the grid of the tube, which is the controlling element that controls the electron flow. And then you have your, in the plate circuit, which is, you get the uh, somewhat amplified signal now going through the headphones in series with the, with the B battery. By the way, the term A supply and B supply are still used today, even, even whether they're batteries or not. This grid leak resistor was not present in, uh, in uh, uh, the original uh, DeForest design. And that was not too good because if you don't have it, the grid is just floating in a DC sense and it can obtain whatever bias potential that it, it happens to pick up from stray electrons. Anyway, the, audio, uh, the original Audion and the forest circuit had some serious shortcomings. First was a soft vacuum, which meant it wasn't a hard vacuum. A uh, there was residual gas, uh, enough that it formed a lot of ions. There was, there was no, uh, there was no uh, grid leak or other circuit to, uh, to provide fixed bias on the, on the grid. So it could float to whatever voltage it felt like. The, uh, the inline geometry uh, was less than optimal and the tube was unreliable with a short life. And part of the reason for the short life was that with an imperfect vacuum, the, the uh, residual gas ions being positive would accelerate backward and, and, and strike the filament dislodging or sputtering off material until they ruin the filament. The worst problem though was that unfortunately Lee DeForest did not understand the theory. He believed that a perfect vacuum wouldn't work. He could not uh, conceive of current passing through empty space. So uh, perhaps uh, we can excuse this a bit because uh, the electron had been discovered only eight years earlier and the, and the results of, the, of that research had appeared more in the physics literature than in the engineering journals. The next series of de developments came surprisingly not in wireless, but in wired communication, the telephone. Phone companies, specifically uh, AT&T, were trying to extend the range of, uh, of the telephone for long distance calls. Telephones have been extending range with heavier copper lines and impedance matching loading coils, but you can only go so far in both senses with these techniques. Still, AT&T set itself the ambitious goal of a transcontinental telephone line running all the way from New York City to San Francisco uh, to coincide with the opening of the 1915 Trans-Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. They knew 
This would take a technical breakthrough requiring amplified repeaters along the route. The concept of a repeater is not new. Telegraphs have been using the repeater uh, uh, for decades in the form of relays and hence the name. A relay is called a relay because it, in its original use, it relayed the signal. Here you go, the weak signal comes into the coil, magnetizes it, pulls down this armature, which then switches a, a, a high voltage battery to transmit the signal back down, uh, down the line to the next station. The problem here is that a relay is either on or off. In, in the modern uh, terminology, we could call it digital. Phones, however, need a linear amplifier. DeForest Audion was still not up to the job, but AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph, saw its potential, so, they, so their Western Electric Research Facility in New York City, which was to become Bell Labs, bought a license from DeForest in 1912 with the intention of developing the Audion into a telephone repeater. Researchers headed by Dr. Harold Arnold undertook a dedicated program to perfect a suitable amplifier. GE initiated a, a parallel research program led by physicist Irving Langmuir, who became quite famous. The first uh, problem they addressed was, was the first that we named high vacuum. Arnold and especially Langmuir realized that the residual gas was not, was not only unnecessary, but in fact was bad. Both teams exploited the advances in vacuum pumps to get hard vacuums in the range of 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus seven tor. A tor, for those who don't know, is a pressure unit used in vacuum technology equal to one millimeter of mercury pressure. And, and it's named for uh, Evangelista Torricelli who invented the barometer in 1643. Now 10 to the minus six tor calculates out to approximately a billionth of an atmosphere that's 10 to the minus ninth of an atmosphere. Now Langmuir at GE uh, applied rigorous physics to, the, to, uh, to uh, electron tubes, improving the design, geometry, and especially the, the performance. And one consequence of, of the geometry was a concentric triode, where instead of having the elements in line, they, they're, they're built as concentric cylinders. Uh, cathode, grid, and plate. The amplifier circuits for the tubes now added a DC path, which we call a grid leak, to set the grid bias in the most linear part of the transfer curve in order to maximize gain and minimize distortion. The contributions of Arnold, Langmuir, and their teams perfected tubes for the repeater. And in 1913, they tested a line from New York City to Philly, which is about 100 miles, and thereafter AT&T rushed to build a transcontinental line between New York and San Francisco. And here we have uh, the joining of the eastbound and westbound wires at the Utah-Nevada border, a scene reminiscent of the driving of the Golden Spike for the Transcontinental Railroad dec decades earlier. The line the line's opening at the International Expedition with great fanfare occurred on January 25th, 1915. They recently had a celebration of the anniversary. And it also demonstrated the vacuum tube as a reliable amplifier. Now, what, what are some other vacuum tube functions? We've talked about radio detectors and simple amplifiers, but that was just a start. Edwin H. Armstrong was a hero who developed uh, most of the exciting new vacuum tube circuits. He designed them in his lab at Columbia U in New York City and field tested them when necessary in the open spaces of New Jersey. Armstrong's first major accomplishment was, was to exploit the gain of the triode with positive feedback to create the oscillator, which could generate sinusoidal RF at accurate and stable frequencies. Just as the escapement of a clock replenishes the mechanical energy losses in the oscillating pendulum, the triode with positive feedback does the same sort of thing for a resonant LC, LC circuit. Now, this, um, this uh, feedback coil is called a tickler. 
and its spacing or coupling to the uh, to the tuning coil is adjustable. So you can get you can bring it close enough to get the oscillation to kick in. When the feedback is in phase and strong enough, the circuit will oscillate. Armstrong's curiosity led him to test feedback levels just below the threshold of oscillation, leading to the regenerative receiver. It allowed one tube to have a gain of, of 10,000 or so and detect even weak signals. The ability of a single tube to achieve such enormous gain in selectivity was especially important given the limited availability and high price of tubes at that time. The regen requires a skillful and uh, uh, operator, however, frequently tweaking the feedback. Too little and you don't realize the, the gain you want and too much and it breaks into oscillation radiating RF back into the back out the antenna and causing interference with other radio receivers. And here we have the regenerative receiver. It looks almost like the oscillator except that now uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of a hybrid between the uh, the um, uh, Audion receiver and the oscillator. Once again, the signal comes in from the antenna, goes into this coil here, I guess amplified by the tube, and then uh, off the plate gets fed back and through the headphones and all of that. This is the B battery, this is the A battery. The A battery, as you see, lights the filament. Um, and here we have a regenerative receiver that RCA put out uh, in around 1920 or so. Uh, it was made for them by Westinghouse. Remember the collaboration was set up between the companies because RCA at that time had no manufacturing capacity. It was called the, the Areola Senior. I don't know if there was a junior, but that's the one that we could put on the market. Then in 1918, while serving in the Army Signal Corps during World War I, um, uh, Armstrong invented the superheterodyne. He likes to give things fancy names, the circuit that still dominates receivers to this very day. The superhet, uh, as you can see, uses much more stages, and it can be built with either tubes or transistors. The signal comes into an RF amplifier and gets boosted. A local oscillator with a frequency offset from the uh, signal from the frequency you're receiving feeds into the mixer and the difference frequency goes to an IF amplifier, intermediate frequency amplifier to a second detector and outward to the audio amplifier, which drives a loudspeaker. Now, the idea is that, that you only have to tune the RF amplifier, uh, mixer and local oscillator because it's frequency difference between these two is conserved and so the IF amplifier can be tuned once and forgotten and, uh, and uh, built with as whatever selectivity you need. Well, we now move on to broadcasting and networks. We saw earlier how the government takeover of American Marconi created RCA to handle point to point communication. But as more people were able to own receivers like the one I just showed you, a new idea arose, broadcasting. The term comes from, the, from agriculture, where the farmer, rather than planting seeds individually, broadly casts them over the tilled field. One transmitter thus spreads its signal to many receivers. <clears throat> RCA and Westinghouse opened broadcasting stations in New York and New Jersey. And in 1926, RCA founded the National Broadcasting Company, NBC, by leasing telephone lines from AT&T, uh, NBC created a network su such that multiple stations in different cities could transmit a program simultaneously to audiences far beyond the range that you could get with a single transmitter. The two other major networks, ABC and CBS, also started about this time, and the smaller, now defunct Dumont network operated in New Jersey and New, and New York until about 1956. During the 20s, vacuum tubes underwent enormous improvement, adding additional grids, created the tetrode and pentode, which, which uh, provided vastly improved uh, gain and stability, especially at the higher radio frequencies. Now, for those interested in this topic, 
my uh, sound off talk of January for 31st on how the vacuum tube brought about the age of electronics is online and is listed in the references. The vacuum tube is well suited, suited to audio amplification. Adding audio stages to radio receivers gives them more volume and the ability to drive loudspeakers rather than just headphones. But beyond that, audio amplifiers enable public address systems uh, and led to the vast improvements in sound recording and playback. The original phonograph was strictly mechanical and acoustical. This is, this is the one that we have at the Sonoff Museum called the Victrola. Recording required loud, but, but the problem with that was recording required loud sounds to go in. Playback volume and, and fidelity were quite limited. In fact, fidelity was pretty lousy. Electronic amplifiers overcame those limitations. So when RCA merged with the Victor Talking Machine Company uh, of Camden in 1928 to form RCA Victor, uh, the electronics merged with, the, with, uh, with um, Victor's mechanical manufacturing capacity and uh, uh, to produce electronic phonographs. Incidentally, amplification also made possible magnetic recording. Electronic instrumentation, electrical and electronic engineering demands reliable, accurate measuring, in measuring instruments, as does servicing. Inventors and companies in the New Jersey, New York City area pioneered this as well. Edward Weston, already an inventor, recognized the need for improved electrical instruments. Therefore, in 1988, he founded the Weston Electrical Instrument Company in Newark. His products were and still are renowned the world over for their craftsmanship and accuracy. Meters, voltmeters and ammeters often had better than one quarter of 1% accuracy. While not technically electronic, because there's no tubes or anything in them, Weston meters were instrumental, pun intended, in the development of that industry. Here we have a, a Weston Model 1 millivolt meter made around, 19, around 1890. So it would be about, 100 and, oh, about 130 years old. And by the way, to this day, that meter is still accurate. And Weston also made extremely good watt meters. This one lives in a nice mahogany case. And, uh, it's um, quite, it, it reads true watts, not just a volt amp product. Classical electric voltmeters work by feeding the unknown voltage through a resistor into a, into a current meter. By Ohm's law, voltage is the product of current times resistance. The meter is calibrated uh, 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 to read the applied voltage. If, however, the voltage source has in, some internal series resistance, the current to deflect the meter will load the source and give a, a falsely low reading. The vacuum tube voltmeter, VTVM, places a tube amplifier with ex extremely high grid input resistance ahead of the meter, essentially eliminating this loading error. In addition, limited plate saturate, the limited plate saturation current, in other words, the tube will only conduct, the, uh, the cathode will only emit so, many, so much electron current, protects the meter movement from overscale accidents. You know, if you have it on the one volt scale and you apply 50 volts, you're not gonna blow the meter movement. Here's a, 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 simple, a simplified schematic of a VTVM. The, the uh, unknown voltage goes into the grid of this tube and it, it, it balances against this one so that you, uh, you, get better, you get linearity and you cancel out any residual current. And here's your meter that reads it out over here. Some years later, RCA marketed its line of volt ohmist VTVMs. This one here lives at, at the Sonoff uh, Museum, and it both serves it serves both as an exhibit and a working instrument. Another test instrument is a signal generator, uh, in which a tunable oscillator 
uh, produces a signal of calibrated frequency and amplitude to test and align radio and TV receivers. Other New Jersey companies invented and produced more specialized instruments. <coughs> Booten Radio and its spin-offs started in the town of that name. <coughs> the instrument that made Booten Company famous was its Q meter. And I have one of those. It, uh, what it does is it can accurately measure the inductance and the Q of RF coils at their working frequency. Uh, the Q is the sort of a quality factor of, a, of an inductor. In other words, the absence of losses due to resistance and uh, radiated uh, uh, waves and such. Compare it, say, think of a pendulum, which once again, one of which swings freely without with hardly any air resistance or drag and the other, which say is dipped into a liquid and it, and it damps out after a few swings. Anyway, it puts the coils uh, 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 in series with a resonant circuit, in a series resonant circuit, driving them with an internal calibrated oscillator and measuring the voltage at the LC junction, which uh, which then uh, is defined as the Q. Bolt Booten also made a full range of signal generators and RF test equipment. They were pretty strictly limited to the radio frequency business. A spin-off company was a measurements corporation, also in Booten, probably best known for its grid dip meter, also uh, known as the megacycle meter. And this is the full kit. It has three heads, one with a, one for the medium frequencies, one for the uh, low frequencies, and one for the high frequencies. Here are the plug-in coils that go into the, into the various heads, and here's the readout and power supply that lives in here. The cable connects this, this with the various heads. Next, next uh, item is FM radio. Returning to broadcasting, the next, the next major advance was wide band all electronic frequency modulation, certainly the best known of Edwin Armstrong's inventions. Whoop. Let's compare AM and FM waveforms. You have the carrier wave, which is at radio frequency, and you have the audio waveform, which is at much lower audio frequency. Amplitude modulation raises and lowers the amplitude of the wave in time with the uh, uh, audio input. FM, the amplitude is constant, but the frequency gets lower and higher, lower and higher in time with the audio wave. Now, a major problem with AM is atmospheric noise. This consists of static plus man-made interference from arcing switches, gas engines, spark uh, ignition systems, etc. Working at his, his lab at Columbia U, Armstrong reasoned that he could eliminate this problem by modulating the carrier frequency while keeping the amplitude constant, as I just showed in that drawing. Frequency modulation. Uh, 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 was accomplished by using a circuit called the reactance modulator add, added to the transmitter oscillator that shifted the frequency. At the receiving end of the receiver, the IF amplifier included a limiter stage, which would saturate at even moderate signal levels, thus erasing any residual amplitude modulation or accidental, including static, before it reached the detector. Finally, a circuit called the frequency discriminator uh, converted the frequency fluctuations into their original audio content. He patented it in 1933. In 34, Armstrong demonstrated his FM system in Haddonfield uh, uh, to David Sarnoff of RCA. But Sarnoff had invested heavily in AM and with R his R&D resources heavily committed to TV, Sarnoff couldn't see the profit in creating this whole new system uh, of radio transmission. Therefore, in 1937, Arm Armstrong decided to go off on his own, and he built his own station at the New Jersey Palisades uh, to broadcast FM programs across the Hudson to fans in New York. And this tower is still there, by the way. It's used for other purposes, obviously, but it's, it's still there. 
He operated in 42.8 megahertz in the newly assigned 42 to 50 band. When FM proved its value for both broadcasting and for military communication during World War II, Sarnoff realized he had missed the boat. The relationship between the two guys turned nasty and, uh, and the feud between Armstrong and Sarnoff continued. In 1945, when the Federal Communications uh, uh, Commission was reassigning the frequencies that the military had commandeered for the war, Sarnoff was on the committee and he successfully pushed to move the uh, FM band to its current place between 88 and 108 mega, megahertz. Uh, unfortunately, that's put for, for, uh, for Armstrong, this put his uh, FM system out of business. We don't usually think of radio astronomy as something from New Jersey, but it is. Because sometimes uh, discoveries come about by accident, but to quote Louis Pasteur, chance favors the prepared mind. Such was the case with radio astronomy. In 1931, Bell Labs at Homedale was experimenting with shortwaves around 20 megahertz for transoceanic communication. They, they, these frequencies were attractive because uh, of ionospheric skip, which allowed them to propagate way beyond the uh, curvature of the Earth, and because static from lightning is concentrated more at the low frequencies, but noise was still a problem. Bell assigned a young engineer named Carl Jansky to analyze the sources. He built a fully steerable directional antenna tuned to 20.5 megahertz. And here's Jansky's antenna. And even after accounting, but even, even after accounting for atmospherics, the receiver's internal noise sources uh, uh, were also ex explored. But still, you were picking up a continuous hiss coming from the sky. He tracked it for over a year and found that the, using the directionality of the antenna, and found that its origin was not the sun nor, the earth, nor any earthly source. The main clue was that, was that, was that the origin tracked sidereal rather than solar time. It, it originated outside the solar system. In fact, it was coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Thus was born radio astronomy. Unfortunately, once Bell had identified the noise source, it was not interested in investing further in this research. But after World War II, radio astronomy grew into a recognized field. The unit of, of, of uh, signal intensity, the Jansky, was named for him. One Jansky equals 10 to the minus 26 watts per, per square meter. That's a pretty low number. But at one gigahertz, one JY, the symbol for Jansky, is 10 to the minus 17th watts per square meter. You need a lot of square meters on that antenna to collect a lot of signal, but that's the definition. <clears throat> By a, a similar accident in 1964 occurred when Bell Lab scientists Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias discovered the microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang. Television. From the beginning of the 20th century, inventors experimented with the idea of transmitting moving pictures over wires and radio. <clears throat> the early systems used mechanical scanning, such as a NIPCOW disk for both transmitting and receiving. It wasn't very practical. So until vacuum tubes uh, came about, television was not, electronic television was not feasible. The first demonstrations in the 1920s uh, used the iconoscope camera tube and the kinescope or cathode ray picture tube, both inventions of Vladimir Zworkin. He had started the research at Westinghouse in Pittsburgh, but that company showed little interest in television. He therefore moved to RCA in Camden in 1930, where Sarnoff would support his TV projects. Development continued until both Dumont and Sarnoff demonstrated their TV systems at the 1939 New York World's Fair. And here we have Sarnoff at the fair, standing before his TV camera. And under this uh, roof here are receivers that are showing the picture generated in the camera. 
TV set production was suspended during the war, although limited broadcasting did continue. So did research, resulting in the orthicon and image orthicon camera tubes. The ortho in the name derives from the inline, from the inline geometry versus the uh, offset iconoscope. The um, image orthicon is short, name is shortened to IMI, uh, which then got feminized to Emmy to be the name of that female statue that's given as, the, as an award for uh, contributions to, to television, arts, and sciences. Anyway, the IMI uh, added electron multiplication by secondary emission, similar to a photomultiplier tube, raising the sensitivity by a factor of more than 100. You could, you could take TV pictures by moonlight. At the receiving end, RCA improved, improved, introduced improved cathode ray tubes. When TV production restarted after the war, RCA's first commercial set was the uh, six, uh, 621 TS in 1946. And uh, we have one of these at the Sarnoff Museum and it works. Two years later, RCA introduced the improved 8 TS-30, its first mass produced set with a gigantic 10 inch screen. And once again, we have one of those and it works. In fact, we have it playing all day long when, 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 the, when the museum is open. Transistors. During the 1930s, engineers kept pushing radio to higher and higher frequencies, but at hundreds of megahertz, vacuum tube detectors became ineffective largely because of the transit times and stray reactances. Russell Ohl, spelled O-H-L at Bell, decided to explore silicon detectors, which had had some success in the crystal set era. Working with chemists, he, he uh, used extremely pure silicon to make a point contact diode. Here's a microwave diode, uh, and they, they could rectify at microwave frequencies, that is uh, gigahertz, thousands of megacycles, megahertz. They proved indispensable to the radar receivers of World War II. Ohl also observed and documented the photovoltaic effect that occurred with silicon and that it was much more efficient than, uh, than copper oxide or selenium, which had been explored in the past. And as we know, most solar cells today use silicon. After the war, Bell Labs continued its experiments to make a semiconductor amplifier, hoping to parallel the leap that had occurred between the Fleming diode and the DeForest triode. At that time, silicon was too difficult to purify and dope, so they moved to germanium. With this materi material, William Shockley, John Bardeen, and Walter Bretain created and demonstrated the first point contact resistor, in transistor, I'm sorry, in 1947, an accomplishment that won them the 1956 uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. And here we have a replica of the first point contact transistor. And, here, uh, and here's a, a drawing of how it's laid out. The emitter, the base here, and the collector. Part of AT&T's terms as a regulated monopoly required that they license their patents to other companies without charge and this led to the widespread uh, commercialization of the transistor. So mass production began in 1952 uh, and germanium ju junction transistors soon became available to Raytheon, GE and other manufacturers. They also found their way into consumer products which needed to be compact and able to run economically on batteries. Remember the transistor does not need power to light a filament and it's obviously much more compact than a vacuum tube. Here we have the Raytheon CK722, which was a favorite of experimenters. I played with them when I was a kid, and the 2N107 by GE, uh, which were both germanium PNP junction transistors. And here we have a pocket radio that uses transistors. Transistor radio makers in those days used to boast of how many transistors they had, and even though some of them didn't actually do any work. Once silicon purification was perfected, silicon began replacing germanium. Computers. The most critical application for transistors, however, was in the in digital computers. 
I certainly can't skip this here at the Ted Computer Festival. Even before the transistor, New Jersey and New York City scientists and inventors had contributed to the foundation for digital computers. The famous mathematician, <coughs> Professor John von Neumann, <coughs> excuse me, worked at the Institute for Advanced Studies from 1933 till the end of his life in 57. He wrote papers on the theory of computers and conceived the idea of storing the program in the computer's memory, thus vastly improving versatility. Von Neumann helped build a computer for the Institute and also contributed to the design of early government and, uh, and war department computers such as Maniac, Ordvac, Nork, and the famous Univac, although the latter was built in Philadelphia. Oh shit! Here's here's. I'm sorry. These have got out of order. Here's the uh, the um, uh, iconoscope and the image orthicon camera tube. Uh, here uh, and here's RCA's computer, the uh, 301 system, which which was one of the first solid state. The uh, Univac used vacuum tubes, zillions of them. <clears throat> Uh, von Neumann also invented a new branch of math called game theory <clears throat> uh, in the military labs at Fort Monmouth did additional work in military computers. Once computers had de demonstrated their, uh, their power, businesses recognized this, their value and computers recognized the demand. And that's when RCA produced their 301 and 601 systems for both business and scientific com computing. They also added memory and microprocessor ICs to their semiconductor line in the 1970s, Joseph Weisbecker of RCA built a Cosmac microcomputer for training and, and, uh, and uh, recreation. It was somewhat similar to the Altair, and it used the RCA ICs uh, for its logic and memory. His daughter Joyce invented games and wrote the software to play them on the Cosmac. Here's the, here's the Cosmac, built with perfboard. There are numerous other innovations uh, from, uh, from the New, jo New Jersey, New York City area, especially in the post-war era, each of which could fill a complete talk or even a book. And I hope to present some of them in the future, but for now, let me list a few. Microwaves and radar. While the fame of the MIT Rad Lab is legendary, the work at Fort Monmouth uh, Bell Labs and RCA uh, just before and during World War II made a substantial contributions to the war effort and to radar thereafter. Color TV, the first all electronic and compatible color TV system came out of RCA Labs and after passing the National Television System Committee and FCC scrutiny became the standard for the, uh, for the US uh, starting in 1953 and 54. The electron microscope, while the first electron microscope was invented in Germany, it was RCA that, put, that first put one into commercial production. And Project Diana, the first moon bounce signal proved that radio waves, they used 111.5 megahertz, could propagate out through the atmosphere and then back through the atmosphere to the ground. Taking, uh, and, uh, and so they would send a pulse of signal out and about two and a half seconds later, traveling at the speed of light to the moon and back, they picked up the echo. We celebrated the 75th anniversary of that just this last January. New Jersey and New York City should be proud of their numerous and diverse contributions toward creating the modern world of electronics. And that's it, folks. Do we have any questions, discussion, whatever? Uh, I want to. I think we have some time for questions. Uh, thank the speaker for really a, a fascinating talk. And maybe before I open the floor for questions, I'll just comment that um, I uh, I love to stress to my students um, who are electrical and computer engineering um, majors in New Jersey this tremendous history that New Jersey has had in technology, which often is kind of forgotten in some ways. And it's a little surprising that it's disappeared. And I'm sure you could fill a whole talk on divestiture and, and video disc, the two probably major catastrophes that, that uh, led to the decline of technology in our state. But um, yes, uh, I, in fact, I do cover them somewhat in my, uh, in my talk about uh, 
vacuum tubes in the history of electronics. Yeah, definitely. So let's open up to the floor. Let's see if uh, folks have questions. Feel free to unmute yourselves, or if you'd like, just type questions into the chat box. Okay, here we are. I stopped sharing now. John, who's that little person with you? Uh, this is one of my cats. Her name is Annie. Oh, how do you do, Annie? It's a pleasure to have you attending. <laughs> Thank you. So one question I have, Jonathan, is you talked about the uh, the Marconi um, wireless, and then you said it emitted at you know maybe something like four hundred fifty kilohertz. Um, was there a demodulator? Like you can't hear four hundred fifty kilohertz. So how how were you able to receive that without a diode? Without you know what? Wow. Ah, here we go. Uh, the uh, the um, rectifier, the uh, diode. And or the coherer, which would serve the same function, did rectify. But remember, the um, the spark coil that generates the uh, the RF uh, fires a pulse every time it buzzes, so it goes. <coughs> so I, if I wanted to say hello to you, I'd say <coughs> hi. <laughs> so in that sense, it's modulated. It's intrinsically modulated. So it's extremely broadband, is I guess, is that what you're saying? That the it's splattered all over the place. You know, it's illegal to use spark transmitters uh, uh, these days. As soon as vacuum tube transmitters came along, uh, spark transmitters became taboo. They just pollute the ether too much. Um, yes, I have a. I have a, maybe it's a more of a comment than a question. I joined it a little late. I don't know if you mentioned the picture phone that Bell Labs, I think, developed around 1960 or so. It's interesting because we're looking at each other now via Zoom. And uh, at that time, that was a big failure because people didn't really want to be seen by one another, you know, when they made phone calls. So that was, I, was kind of an interesting I, story. I, didn't, I did not include it. Uh, but be, uh, largely because I had a finite amount of stuff I could include and it never really went anywhere. Yeah. I could see serious bandwidth problems with that unless you just sent a still picture which would change every few seconds. Okay. I mean, but audio. I think, I think they, they, they found that it was one of those things that just the public didn't want. They weren't ready for it. <laughs> that, that could also have been a factor. Yeah. yeah? Anything else? Sorry, a couple of those slides got shifted out of order. I think something got messed up in the uh, in the uh, PowerPoint, but at least you got to see them all. Well, Jonathan, I'd like to thank you so much. And maybe we can give some uh, virtual applause. Uh, it was really, uh, really tremendous. And uh, I think- Excellent presentation. Thank well, you. Thank you. Well, we'll get- Great job, Jonathan. We'll get started um, now and we'll get set up for our next presenter. Our 1120 talk uh, will be with Eva Kaplan and I'll just, um, we'll, we'll take a quick break while everything sort of transitions over to our next uh, 